Okay, good morning, friends. And today we will uh, uh, learn something about histamine and its antagonist. Uh, now it's a mind map session, and I try to cover up this session as fast as possible. But I don't limit myself uh, to three minutes for the session because it's slightly uh, extensive when we want to discuss about histamine and uh, drugs which block the action of histamine. So starting with histamine, this histamine is kind of an autopoid substance, a substance which is a kind of a self-healing substance, substance which brings about inflammation at the local level. Histamine is derived from histidine and histamine as you must be all aware is mostly, it's mostly stored in the mast cells. Um, now it also has uh, heparin along with it and the granules of the histamine inside the mast cells and whenever there is a stimuli, the stimuli can be a kind of a hypersensitivity uh, response, IgE mediated response to which uh, these granules uh, uh, are let out and histamine is released uh, into the substance that brings about inflammation as such. Okay, so talking next, histamine has its own receptors to bring about its action. Now, uh, you must be all aware that all histamine receptors are G protein uh, coupled receptors. I hope you know what G protein receptors are. These are transmembrane receptors. Uh, and if you want to know more about this, you can always watch my videos on drug action where I try to explain in detail about a G protein. Uh, coupled receptors and uh, the second messenger systems involved uh, with these receptors. And now traditionally histamine receptors uh, are classified into something like H1 that is histamine receptor 1 and histamine receptor 2. But then also uh, going by the books there are histamine receptors 3 that is H3 and H4 and so on. Uh, but the clinical utility as of now remains uh, low. So I won't be dealing with them because here I am only talking about uh, the established drug treatments and not talking about uh, the targets of the future. So for now we just want to remember that histamine has two kinds of receptors H1 and H2. Now these two receptors are extensively distributed across the body uh, right from the nervous system. Uh, to the cells uh, within the blood as basophils, it is also located within the GIT and so on. So there is a definite pattern for the distribution of these receptors uh, because they carry out so many functions at uh, different levels of the body. <coughs> So if you want to learn something about the action of histamine as such, uh, then uh, as I told you histamine brings about inflammation at the local site. So any topical injection, topical application or injection at the site will cause the triple response. Now triple response deals with physiology that deals with a kind of inflammation that sets in if an irritant is injected within the skin. You all must have observed it uh, when you get a kind of a mosquito bite or something of that sort. There is a kind of a red spot uh, and adjoining area is also looks to be red. And this kind of induration or something of edema which is associated with that uh, uh, bite. So a triple response usually involves uh, uh, a red spot, a wheel and a flare. Anyway, it's, it's to deal with pathology but whatever it is appeals to me uh, clinically is that there is kind of inflammation that sets in uh, if you are injecting irritant at the local uh, level. Uh, anyway, this uh, triple response also relates to dilatation of uh, the small vessels and our small vessels are dilated by histamine by release of EDRF uh, that is endothelial derived uh, uh, relaxing factor that causes dilatation of the vessels but at the same time large vessels uh, of the body constrict. Uh, usually the blood pressure falls uh, after giving uh, injection of histamine now that uh, that's attributed to uh, H1 as well as the H2 response. The H1 is kind of an immediate response but H2 mediated fall is something which is delayed and more sustained fall in the blood pressure occurs uh, if you are injecting uh, histamine uh, at a large dose inside the body. Uh, irritation of the skin occurs of course uh, and of course of the nerve endings also occur if you are injecting histamine and that might inflict pain to a degree. 
uh, bronchoconstriction occurs uh, if uh, histamine is inhaled in fact uh, one ways to study histamine as far as uh, you know uh, animal studies are concerned if you want to test any drug for any respiratory condition is uh, to you know uh, inject histamine in uh, uh, I think guinea pigs and uh, you want to see the construction of the tracheobronchial tree uh, in them it's also given as aerosol form uh, sometimes so that's where bronchoconstriction uh, relates to histamine uh, gastric secretion is increased uh, in histamine uh, with histamine uh, that's also attributed to the release of uh, uh, large amounts of acid uh, and we have various drugs which block uh, this release uh, by blocking specific receptors of histamine now as far as gastric secretion is concerned it's very important that you know that it's mediated by the h2 receptors adrenaline is released in response uh, to injection of histamine uh, in fact there's one more thing which is not mentioned here i don't know how much clinical uh, importance to that should be given but as far as heart is concerned then the contraction of the heart increases uh, the force increases uh, with the help of H2 receptors if histamine is injected within the body as far as H1 receptors are, are concerned what I remember is that there is a delay in signaling of uh, the impulse uh, uh, especially through the AV node if uh, H1 mediated response occurs. So it's a complex thing. But anyway, uh, if you want, you want to remember even for the heart that the contraction increases uh, if you are injecting large amounts of hysteria. As far as uh, CNS effects are concerned, it's a very complex thing, but it also acts as a neurotransmitter at some of the levels uh, within uh, the body. It says uh, mainly to uh, maintain awareness, it's also to maintain the appetite and so on. So, uh, so that's where histamine uh, has a role as far as CNS is concerned, uh, uh, effects on CNS is concerned. Um, now, this is very important. Uh, drugs like competitive blockers, especially d tubocurin it's a kind of an NM junction uh, uh, kind of a, a blocker. Uh, I think the prototype blocker, we don't use it anymore, but it causes release of histamine. Antibiotics like vancomycin, aphrodisiac drugs like morphine, uh, for their opioid drugs also uh, cause histamine to get released. In addition to that, any kind of allergic response, any kind of injury or trauma uh, can also lead to uh, release of histamine and you can see the effects uh, onto the body. Uh, as far as drugs which are pro-histamine or which are acting in line with histamine is a drug called as beta histine. Now this drug is used extensively in minus disease or vertigo which causes vasodilatation in the internal ear and which deals with uh, bringing down uh, the levels of uh, deafness in individuals especially to deal with uh, uh, vertigo and minus disease as well as i don't know did i talk about deafness and not it's not about deafness it's also about vertigo sorry for that so it brings about uh, changes which helps in treatment of vertigo uh, in these individuals uh, as far as blockers are concerned let's start with uh, the h1 blockers now remember these are all me2 drugs are the same kind of drugs sister drugs brother drugs whatever you want to call it as <coughs> the only difference between them is that uh, as far as conventional drugs are concerned, conventional H1 blockers are concerned, then these drugs do cross the blood brain barriers, so bring about uh, adverse effects like sedation and so on. As compared to the newer agents which are polar drugs which are unable to cross the blood brain barrier and as far as uh, frequency of administration is concerned, it's mostly once a day. So that's the base difference between these uh, two uh, you know, uh, uh, classifications uh, of drugs as far as new and conventional is concerned. But as far as one drug is concerned over the other within the category, that means within the new ones or within the conventional ones, 
there is nothing like some uh, a particular drug is better than the other in a treatment of a condition or something of that sort except for ciprohepatidine and sinarizin which have specific roles to be played uh, and use is also attributed according to it in therapeutics. Now we will go one by one as far drugs are concerned so it is diaphentramine and dimenhydrinate. Uh, now these drugs you might find mostly in cough cold mixtures. Uh, because they block the allergies associated uh, with the cold, it is rhinitis and so on. So that is where uh, their, uh, you know, uh, their utility lies. They also have a very strong anti-cholinergic uh, effect and which can bring about a lot of side effect profile to this drug. A uh, promethazine is a drug which is extensively used again. Uh, but uh, mostly used, I would say, for uh, conditions uh, like uh, you know, treatment of acute dystonias. That's uh, uh, that happens when a person is given uh, mostly an antipsychotic agent. That is an extra pyramidal side effect. So you want to do parental promethazine. It's also used, uh, I think, as uh, as a, what I should say as a drug for motion sickness even though we have drugs like scopolamine that can be used. Uh, then drugs like phenylamine again a me too drug uh, which is more conventional so more sedation and uh, cholinergic effects are seen. Chlorophenylamine again you know same class uh, again treatment of minor elements like rhinitis, allergies, soft tissue, skin allergies so on you want to give this drug. <coughs> now there are specific drugs in conventional variety that is Sinarizin. Now Sinarizin is a drug which is uh, mostly used again in ENT to tackle vertigo because it again causes uh, dilatation of the vessels. At the same time it also tries to manage the calcium content within the inner ear so helps in the treatment of vertigo. Ciprohepatidin is a drug which can increase the appetite so it is a good drug as far as uh, people with whom immuno, uh, not immuno, uh, appetite suppressant is, uh, uh, is a matter of concern. As far as new agents are concerned, uh, Fexofenadine, Cetrizine, Leocetrizine, Loratidine, Desloratidine, Rupatidine, Azelastin, all these drugs, whatever, there might be more number of drugs than what I have mentioned here. <coughs> Remember, all these drugs are long acting drugs, maybe mostly once a day or maximum maybe twice a day. Uh, they do not cause the blood pill barrier, they have very few uh, anticholinergic effects, so side effect profile is much more manageable and again as far as uh, you know, conditions where allergies are concerned, uh, you want to use these drugs uh, uh, more as compared to the conventional ones uh, because the side effect profile sedation is less. Uh, now one more thing you want to note about these new agents is that these uh, new agents can have interaction as far as uh, you know the potassium channels are concerned in the heart. So they might cause an increase in uh, QTC interval uh, especially in people who are already prone to heart diseases. So you want to avoid this uh, agents in people who already have heart problems or who already have uh, for some or other reason a prolonged QT interval. At the same time you also do not want to give these drugs along with any enzyme inhibitors. Uh, best example would be drugs like erythromycin, macrolide or uh, the next would be antifungal drugs because these drugs can delay the metabolism of these agents and that can bring about a high level of this drug within the blood at the same time cause heart problems in people who are already prone to CVS injuries. Uh, so that is the only limitation of these drugs is concerned. Uh, in my own uh, opinion even though they say that they do not cross the blood brain barrier but still uh, we, I have seen that it do cause sedation. Anyway it is uh, up to us as a experience whether to know that sedation or not in uh, theory is concerned. <coughs> uh, as far as uh, side effect profile is concerned, sedation is a major side effect uh, that one needs to uh, tackle. Uh, now, separation of appetite can be a problem. Anti-allergic uh, 
it, it's a good thing that happens with uh, the actual blockers they also have anticholinergic side effect and prolonged QTC interval in the heart also occurs uh, with this drug. As far as anti-allergy and suppression of appetite is concerned, uh, now that can be an uh, issue uh, with these drugs. Now, H1 blockers are used in rhinitis, uh, allergy of various causes, mostly skin and soft tissue, cough, uh, it can bring down cough, especially dry irritant cough, motion sickness. Uh, dystonias that is uh, uh, what is that extra operational side effects with drugs and uh, because of their anticholinergic uh, you know effects the conventional uh, h1 blockers especially promethazine and so on can be used in parkinson's also uh, as far as h2 blockers are concerned now uh, we will be dealing with h2 blockers in much more detail later on when we will learn about peptic ulcer but they are mostly selective for gastric mucosa, few drugs like cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine are uh, well known and are used extensively in medical practice. As far as areas is concerned, then enzyme inhibition uh, uh, is a major uh, limitation for use of cimetidine. As far as ranitidine and famotidine concerned, uh, that effect is not so much of concern. A gynecomastia do occur. Uh, Pranicardia on IV injection and CNS stimulations are also seen with these drugs. <coughs> of course, ranitidine and famotidine are much more potent as compared to cimetidine and have taken over as uh, uh, drugs for mostly treatment of peptic ulcer as against cimetidine. Now, H2 blockers are used in gastritis, GERD, that is gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer, H1 to other treatments. And sometimes people get so many other diseases, but you want to do ranitidine or famotidine just as an H1 to a lot of treatments uh, with just symptomatic relief and no clear cut demarcation of why it should be given. Uh, rare one would be a gastrin secreting tumor uh, in which you want to give. Uh, H2 blockers also in a large uh, proportion. Uh, what is that uh, syndrome? Is uh, I don't remember now. Okay, Zollinger Ellis syndrome. Okay, that's what is gastrin secreted tumor. So, you want to give these drugs. The last but not the least, you want to still remember that do not give again very important do not give. H1 blockers, I am not talking of H2 blockers, I am just talking of H1 blockers uh, during any kind of active work because they can cause sedation and that can be an issue with uh, the people uh, when they are doing some active work or in office. You do not want to consume chlorpheniramine uh, especially uh, because that is mostly given by so many family physicians for cough, cold and fever. Uh, I don't know for why they give it for fewer, but anyway, it's a uh, it's a compound which is mixed with so many other drugs useful for cough, cold, and fever. So that's why you do not want yourself to sleep in a meeting. You do not want to sleep when you are driving. You do not want to sleep when uh, you are doing some active work with machinery. Uh, in all cases where you do not want to sleep and you take this drug, you will feel so drowsy. So do not use H1 blockers. And that's it from me now, a uh, very small uh, uh, area to learn, uh, but with a lot of applications as far as family practice uh, is concerned. And a few things which deals with ENT, especially drugs like beta histine, cinnarizine, and of course ciprohepatidine, uh, which deals uh, with uh, appetite. Uh, so that's it from me now. H2 blockers again. Uh, we will learn about them later on in much more detail and try to place their, uh, how they are, uh, place uh, them in the right perspective. Uh, uh, but that is that's the later part of the story. Uh, so that is it from me now. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a nice day. Bye.